Before we introduce our keynote speaker, please allow us to recognize and to thank our colleagues and friends from the embassies of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and also to welcome guests from Vietnam and around the U.S. who have traveled long distances to be with us in person. It is an honor to be able to host you in this building. When the shades are up, we overlook the Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall, and we are very near many landmark U.S. memorials, which I hope, if you are a guest here, that you are able to visit. We're also very pleased to welcome congressional colleagues who are here today and who continue to sustain America's commitment to peace, prosperity, and security in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Secretary Chuck Hagel. Secretary Hagel was the 24th U.S. Secretary of Defense, serving from February 2013 to February 2015. He is the only Vietnam veteran and the first enlisted combat veteran to serve as Secretary of Defense. Secretary Hagel's, to, Hagel's service to his country is exemplary. He has served two terms in the United States Senate representing Nebraska and was the co-chairman of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and the chairman of the Atlantic Council. Secretary Hagel currently serves on the Board of Advisors of the United States Military Academy, the Board of Trustees of the RAND Corporation, the Advisory Board of Corsair Capital as a Centennial Scholar at Georgetown University, as a Distinguished Scholar at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, as a Distinguished Statesman at the Atlantic Council, on the Board of Directors of the Public Broadcasting Service, and on the Board of Trustees of the United States Capitol Historical Society. Secretary Hagel is the author of the book, America, Our Next Chapter. At the end of Secretary Hagel's comments, he will be taking questions from the floor. We have microphones here, and we encourage colleagues to please take advantage. Mr. Secretary, we are honored to have you with us at USIP today for this important discussion. Thank you, Madam President. It's a truly a, a privilege to be here to share some thoughts with so many people who whose lives and professions, avocations, vocations uh, have been about making a better world, a better world for all people. Uh, not just the United States or Vietnam or any other country. Uh, I think if there was ever a time for an emphasis on that and a reality to that, it's today's world. As we all know, uh, we are living in a world of nearly 8 billion global citizens. Yes, American citizens, Vietnamese citizens, Laotian citizens, Thai citizens, but we're all global citizens. And a clear understanding of that I don't think has been yet accepted by a lot of countries. And if there is to be a world that's not just prosperous for all people, uh, but a world that's fair, that's honest, that's hopeful, uh, we're going to have to change how we do business. And one of the reasons the U.S. Institute of Peace has been so important since its founding, and I recall when we got the funding, it was Ted Stevens, as Jim Reeser knows, who was the, the guiding focus light <clears throat> um, and road plow 
that got it done. Uh, but it has um, been symbolic for many reasons. Uh, yes, peace, uh, but more than that, because it brings people together in a very important way, uh, like today and tomorrow. So thank you all for what you're doing, and we all appreciate it uh, very much. Ambassador, nice to see you again, Tim Reeser. Ann Mills Griffith, who is a, I won't say old, but a, a good friend. <clears throat> but um, Ann and I have been around uh, together a long time and fought in the trenches uh, for veterans, Vietnam veterans. And uh, I admire her very much. And what Tim Reeser has done with Pat Leahy has been remarkable uh, over, the, over the years. So thank you uh, all. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, fairly brief, so uh, I don't want to throw off your schedules, uh, because then uh, we'll have more time for questions and get to talk about whatever you want. But as I was uh, thinking about uh, today, uh, over the last week, um, what I might contribute to this gathering, and I know it's about lessons learned. It's about all those dynamics of the relationship with Vietnam and the United States. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just give you a, a, a brief, very brief background on my knowledge of Vietnam, and then um, give you four basic lessons learned that, that I have thought about over the years when I was in the Senate uh, before that. Uh, I've always been involved in veterans organizations, helping veterans. But um, I w served in Vietnam in 1968, and uh, I think most of you recall that year. It was a bad year. Uh, we sent 16,000 dead Americans home in one year. Uh, today, America wouldn't stand for that. My brother Tom served with me. I mean, physically with me uh, for a year. Uh, we were both wounded twice together. That was the year of Tet. Here in this country, what was going on was almost as bad as what was going on in Vietnam. We had two assassinations of King and Kennedy. Cities were burning. Uh, this country was about as at a low a point as it had been, I think, in, in modern times. And it was reflected in Vietnam, how we conducted the war, kind of a mindless approach uh, to it all. In 1999, our new ambassador, uh, appointed by President Clinton, who put the two countries back together and engineered the diplomatic relationship, the United States, Vietnam, uh, selected Congressman Pete Peterson from Florida to be his first ambassador. Peterson was one of the longest held POWs in Illinois, a tremendous person. But he had an unfair advantage in life. He was from Nebraska. <laughs> and I readily admit that he had <clears throat> some advantages. Uh, he was from Omaha, Nebraska, graduated Benson High School and went to the Naval Academy and spent more than six years as a POW. He asked my, my brother Tom and me in 1999, I was in the Senate at the time, to come back to Vietnam and cut the ribbon for the new American consulate in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, all of you know that uh, our consulate in Ho Chi Minh City is on the very spot uh, of where our embassy was during the Vietnam War. Uh, Tom and I did that. It's the first time we had been back since we left. I left in December of 68, and he left in January of 69. But they also took us, because uh, we spent about five days there. I went to Hanoi first, met the prime minister and a number of the minister, foreign minister, defense minister, and then on into Ho Chi Minh City. We spent about five days there, and we were struck with <clears throat> uh, the tremendous progress 
And that progress uh, wasn't just Vietnamese progress, uh, but it was the product of Vietnam's developing relationships with the United States and with other countries. Uh, not just in Asia, but with other countries in the world, and how the Vietnamese had done that, and, and the cooperation. And we had differences with Vietnam, uh, and still do. But what was unique about this relationship, we concentrated on where we agreed. Uh, yes, we just fought a brutal war, a 10-year war, uh, that was very unfair in many ways. It cost us 56,000 lives. It's what the Vietnam Veteran Memorial across the street is all about. But the concentration and the focus on where we agreed, how we could help each other, and Asia, Southeast Asia, trade, commerce, education, especially education, um, and all the facets of a diplomatic relationship that went into it. But this, this relationship that got renewed in the early 90s, and it was done, as Tim Reeser knows, uh, especially uh, by the Vietnam veterans in the Senate at the time. I was not there at the time. I came in 96. But John Kerry, Bob Kerry, John McCain, Chuck Robb uh, really guided that. And they had a, a very receptive president in Bill Clinton. And the rest of the Senate, Pat Leahy, was a huge part of that and made it work. And because they, they built that relationship back in Vietnam, the United States, the way they did, uh, over the next years, including today, uh, it's developed into a very important relationship, and a, I would say mutually important relationship. So that leads me to, as you all know, and much has been written about this relationship, what lessons did, did we learn? Uh, did, did we learn enough? Uh, history informs. And when we don't pay attention to history, when nations are ignorant of history, individual leaders are ignorant of history, uh, unfortunately, they are doomed to make similar miscalculations, misjudgments, and mistakes. And we in the United States have done that because we didn't adhere to, listen to, and absorb lessons learned from Vietnam. The four lessons that I think, at least in my opinion, that we must always learn, and it's a direct result of the Vietnam experience, and a lot is connected into each of these. But the first is military force should never get ahead of diplomatic strategy. Diplomatic strategy must always lead the use of military. And a nation will always run into trouble when that does not happen. And it certainly happened in our 20-year involvements in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had no diplomatic strategy. And some of you know that very well because you were at the, at the table. Um, that's the first lesson. The second lesson is understand the culture, the country, the people, the religion of the other country as best you can. You've got to reverse the optics. The optics can't always be American. Uh, 
we are a small part of the world, 5% of the world's population, 25% of the economy. And we are the dominant nation of the world and have been since World War II. But even with all that power and prestige, we have failed over the years because we didn't learn some lessons of history. And I think part of that, an important part of that, is we venture into areas where we don't understand where we're going and why, and as Colin Powell used to say, what's your exit strategy? We didn't learn that in Vietnam. Certainly, we didn't learn that in Iraq and with Afghanistan, with our disastrous exits. Next lesson learned is when you employ troops in the military, make the, sure they're for a short time. The longer you keep troops in a country, the more you will defeat yourself. You've got to engage the people. The people are the most important part of any relationship, any foreign relationship. That's got to be number one, not the government, but the people. You work with the government. And if that's not understood, you will be seen as occupiers. As an example, in 2008, it wasn't Barack Obama who was elected president in 2008 who campaigned against the Iraq war. It wasn't Barack Obama who pulled the troops out of Iraq. It was George Bush who signed the deal. And George Bush had to do that because the Prime Minister of Iraq at the time, Mr. Maliki, said, I will not take a status of forces agreement to the parliament to protect your troops because you are seeing as occupiers in our country. I think that shocked the Bush administration. President Bush had to sign an agreement for all of our troops to be out by 2011. That's a very clear example of violating that lesson that should be learned. But it always happens. It happened in Afghanistan. And as I tick through these lessons learned, there are a lot of components to each that we could spend almost an afternoon on each of them. The next lesson learned for us I think, and I was there, involved in all three of those wars in one way or another, is the Congress has to be more involved. The Congress has to be more active. When you think about our Constitution in Article I of the Constitution, the executive, I mean the, the, the legislative, the Congress, not the executive, their Article II, the President. And only the Congress has the power to declare war. Well, we've been very dishonest over the years where we don't declare war. We get around it by a Gulf a Tonkin resolution, which was dishonest and a lie. The lies as to what led us into Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction. And the Congress has been, in my opinion, and again, I've been on both sides of, the, of this issue, way too docile. And when the Congress, the representatives of the people, House members, senators, do not stay close to war and foreign policy, no good will come of that. Too much power in the executive. And I think that's a clear lesson learned from Vietnam. It certainly was in the result that we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I recall the special 
investigator for Afghanistan, and Tim Reeser remember this, who was put in place years ago in Afghanistan to go in and investigate where the U.S. funds, the money appropriated for Afghanistan, where did that go? And that special investigator who reported to the President of the United States, not to Congress, uh, would come give his report and would testify before committees in the Congress. I was on the Foreign Relations Committee as to what was going on in Afghanistan. Thirty, forty billion dollars of money that he couldn't find where it went. Well, we know where it went. It was corruption. Corruption in the government. It was corruption of different American country uh, companies. But we didn't pay attention to it. We didn't pay attention to it. And that led to corrupt governments in Afghanistan losing the people, losing the confidence of the people. And then ultimately the United States had to pull out and the people didn't support the government. I would add one additional thing. When you're making peace, and the United States has been in three long wars, 10 years for Vietnam, 20 years for the Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, you, when you're making peace with the other side, you must include the current government of the country that you have been helping. In 1972, we made a peace arrangement with the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, but we left out the government of South Vietnam. Same thing in Afghanistan. Early 2020, 2019 actually, in Qatar, the Trump administration makes a deal with the Taliban, leaves the Ghani government out. And then we go back in and we tell the Ghani government, this is the deal, this is what you're going to live with, and by the way, you're going to release 5,000 prisoners, 5,000 the most dangerous. The Ghani government has no say in any of it, just like the two government had no say in Vietnam in 1972 with that peace agreement. You, you can take each of those and <clears throat> dissect them in small parts and say, yeah, but, 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 but. And I recognize that. There is no perfect analogies or analysis of anything. Uh, differences always. But I'm talking about just general theory, general analysis, general lessons learned. So, um, I'll end where I started. History informs. And when countries and governments don't adhere to that and don't learn that, uh, they're headed for trouble. And in the kind of world that we're in today, a world that's so interconnected, Putin's war in Ukraine, there's not a country in the world that's not affected by that war. Not a country in the world that's not affected by it, whether it's supply chain problems, fuel problems, hunger, politics, diplomacy, we're all affected by it. So we've got to understand all of this now is like handling nitroglycerin. It's, it's that dangerous. And we've got to come at it that way. And again, I go back to where I started. It's personal relationships. Where can we agree? Don't start with where you disagree. You'll never get to where you can agree if that's where you start. You've got to start the other way. Invert the process so you start where can we agree. If we don't do that, this world is going to be very dangerous 
more dangerous than it is now. And this is in addition to what's going on with climate change, COVID, and there'll be more COVIDs. This isn't the end of pandemics. Again, lessons of history. I don't care how sophisticated our medicine is and what's happened just naturally. You've got to factor all of that in. And I will end with this. Listen, people have to listen to each other. They've got to listen with open minds. That's difficult to do, I understand that. With past hatreds, with past problems, past issues, injustices, I get all that, I get all that. But today is gone, tomorrow is gone. It's all about the future. It's all about tomorrow. What can we do to influence tomorrow? And if we don't take that approach in our personal lives, our official lives, then we're doomed. It's all about tomorrow. And how do we make a better world? Okay, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hagel. I'm John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. We worked for many years for normalization with Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. But I want to take you to another part of the world, uh, as you have given us a global scope. It was 20 years to end the embargo and to get normal relations with Vietnam. It's been 60 years with Cuba, and we still don't have it. And I'm curious what you think might finally dislodge that and get us to the period of mutual respect and reconciliation with Cuba, and whether USIP can play a role in that happening. Uh, thank you. Well, interestingly enough, um, I've been thinking about that. And the world and reality uh, uh, and the uncertainty of life in our personal lives and the world, relationships, um, always somehow affect things. Uncertain, unknown, unpredictable. And in the case of Cuba, we have this terrible hurricane Mr. Ian, a nasty fellow, uh, decimated much of Cuba, like it did the west coast of Florida. And the Cuban government reaching out to the United States government for assistance. Well, your question about what could be done to start influencing maybe a reconciliation some way. That's, that's an opening right there. Now, I, I'm not saying that, 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 that we should send a check to Cuba, but I think we should explore that opening, that possibility. Again, it's the people. Yes, Cubans have a corrupt government. Uh, the people in Cuba have very little, have had very little freedom. Um, but this could be an opening. And I actually think climate and weather patterns are, are, are going to affect foreign policy of nations and diplomacy far more than anybody has any ideas. Because it's, it's about survival. Uh, we, we do know that as the oceans rise, uh, there will not be a, a nation that is in any way close to oceans 
it's not going to be significantly affected. Well, you think through that, well, could this be an area where we could maybe reach out to countries and, and work together? Now, I recognize it's not that easy. I recognize all the downsides to that. I recognize corruption. I recognize the people who don't want any reconciliation. But so it has been throughout history. Throughout history, it's not been easy to bring countries together. So I think that, that we need to find some way, to find some way to open that door to reconciliation in Cuba um, for a lot of reasons. It's just in the, the best interest of everybody. And maybe that request coming from the Cuban government for us, and I've, uh, and I've noticed, and, and, and I, Tim Reeser would be far more uh, connected into what's going on with this than me, but um, I've noticed and I've heard that the Biden administration is considering this, looking at it. I don't know where the Congress is on this, but um, I, I do know through all my years in the Senate, uh, no money deals happen unless Tim Razor's involved. So, uh, t talk to Razor about this. And but uh, thank you. Thank you for being here, Secretary Hagel. Uh, my name is Ziep Nguyen Van Hoot. Uh, originally from Vietnam, and now I lead infrastructure investment and development at the International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank Group. Um, my question for you is, given the current tensions and concerns uh, for U.S. policy concerning um, Chinese supply chain issues, including uh, labor issues uh, related to Xinjiang, uh, and very much affecting um, so solar um, panel supply chains and in other supplies of chips as well, um, other uh, components that are very essential for uh, infrastructure development around the world, uh, given that China produces over 95% of the uh, solar panels and, and uh, chips that we need uh, around the world. What is, your, uh, what is your view of how Vietnam can play a role, uh, a more prominent role, uh, given uh, uh, Vietnam's, I'm very proud to say, uh, emerging role or, or actually very solidified role in manufacturing around the world. What is your view about how Vietnam can play a role in, in the emerging manufacturing uh, scene going forward? Uh, well, yeah, I think Vietnam can play a very critical role. Uh, and I say that not, to, not just because we have a number of friends from Vietnam here, uh, but because, uh, first of all, Vietnam, represented by its people, is as industrious a country as there is in the world. Uh, and that's a, in my opinion, that's a, a big compliment. The Vietnamese people know how to get things done. They're pros at manufacturing, agriculture, trade. They get it. They understand, you, you all understand how it works. And because where you're located, where Vietnam is located, is a critical geopolitical, strategic, trade, economic, diplomatic, security part of the world, bordering China. And as you all know, the numbers that are reflected, not just workforce, but markets uh, represented in Asia, and the kind of progress that's been made over the years in Asia. All of that together uh, positions, and for all the reasons I mentioned and more, positions Vietnam in a very critical place. Uh, 
for manufacturing in particular chips or anything else. Now, I mean, we understand Taiwan's dominance in those areas, but we also understand that that's going to have to change in some ways, that the world cannot just rely on one nation for so much, uh, especially of an important product that relates to so many other important products. I mean, microchips are critical. Um, so there will be other countries that will flourish in the manufacturing of, the, of these particularly strategic products. And the U.S. has already started to move in that direction, other countries. And again, where Vietnam is, where it's how it's positioned, where it's positioned, its people, uh, really give, give it, I think, a huge leg up uh, in order to, to do that and to take on these new possibilities, oppor opportunities. And I suspect that that will happen because the Vietnamese, uh, you, all, you all take advantage very wisely uh, uh, of these opportunities. Hi. Hi. I'm a little vertically challenged. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us, uh, Secretary Hagel. Um, so my name is Sarah Gulabdara. Um, I'm with Legacies of War. We're a nonprofit loca located right here in um, Washington, D.C. We advocate for bomb clearance and victim assistance uh, in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So um, since I'm a former corn husker, um, I'm going to ask you an easy You're question. You're never former, Connor. What do you mean? <laughs> I left. I left. Okay, well, but in your heart, you know the corn huskers are mighty. Okay, you're right. Mighty. I yeah. cheer for them, except when they play my Buckeyes. <laughs> <laughs> do they have a team? <laughs> hey, now, hey, be nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to increase the level of difficulty in my question to you now. <laughs> um, and you get this because President Biden won't answer me, so perhaps I get a really good answer from you. Well, um, you got what you needed, then, if, if, <laughs> if Biden's an answer. So, Legacies of War is a proud uh, steering committee member of the U.S. campaign to ban landmine uh, cluster munition coalition. So, you know, the campaign has been in existence since uh, the early 90s, um, and we've been pushing for our country to accede to the Mine Ban Treaty and Convention on Cluster Munition, banning these indiscriminate weapons um, that we as Americans use in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, you talked a lot about lessons learned, and I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, why is it taking so long for our country to stand on the side of humanity and accede to these two treaties, along with uh, other members of NATO allies? Um, it just seems to me that our policy on this is more aligned with Vladimir Putin instead of our NATO allies. Thank you. Uh, well, not because only because you're so intimidating, but I agree with you. Um, Tim Reeser knows a lot about this because Pat Leahy has been a champion on all this for many, many years. Um, and um, no, I, I think you're right. Um, I know there are variations of, and Pat Leahy and I have had, had some long conversations about this when I was in the Senate. Um, I know there are variations of all of this as to, well, does it help American military or where's the mili our, our military and so on and so on. But as I've watched it over the years, I don't think um, I don't think we have any any interest in this other than to support it. And uh, I recognize that there are nations of the world and you mentioned one of them, Mr. Putin's Russia, uh, that, that will never comply with international standards and international law. I mean, he's already, for the last eight months, broken so many uh, of those uh, global, essentially, laws, but broken the whole basis of how the world has operated for the last 75 years. 
a, a world order that we built with our allies after World War II, a world order of laws <clears throat> and regulations. And the Russians have rarely acknowledged those laws and regulations. And, and many times, like they are now, flagrantly, mindlessly violated him. So you're always going to find nations that will not accede to, to what you're talking about. Uh, but I think it's, it's time for the United States to take a leadership role uh, in this. And I'm saying that mindful of, you know, for a, a couple of years I had the responsibility of being the, the chief person in charge of our national security and listening very closely to our military. And uh, so I say this and give you my position, not, not just as a former senator, uh, but someone who's had responsibility for the security of this country and working with our military and understanding their concerns and their, their needs on this issue as all issues. But um, I, I, uh, I can't look at it any other way than, than we need to get behind this. Yes. Hello, Senator. Um, thank you so much for your service in Vietnam. I'm uh, Philip Nguyen, a Vietnamese American from uh, Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is my honor to meet you finally. Uh, thank you so much for your service. And I believe well, my dad probably served with you in Vietnam in 68. Uh, he didn't make it, but we'll come home. Thank you so much. Your, your father was in Vietnam in 68, you said? Yes, yes. And he uh, was killed there? Yes, in Hue, yeah. In Hue? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sorry. And Thank I know, you. I Thank know you're you. proud of his service. Thank you for your service in Thank Vietnam. You. Uh, as I sat this morning in the auditorium and I heard uh, that the U.S. is uh, finally is going to help Vietnam to look for the remains of the North Vietnam. Um, I call them Vietnamese, but I don't call them North Vietnam or South Vietnam. I call them Vietnamese because North Vietnam, South Vietnam are Vietnamese. Now, I'm so happy that we have program to finally help find those missing remains after so many years, right? As you know, Vietnamese American, I ask myself, what about thousands and thousands of South Vietnamese soldiers that one fought with you side by side, like my father, and including thousands of prisoners who have died in re-education camps? Will we have anything to help them? As Vietnamese American, we ask that question because we are now not Vietnamese, but American with Vietnamese heritage. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, there are some individuals here at this table that might be able to give you uh, some answers uh, to that. Um, as we have expanded, as you know, um, our POW MIA efforts, and Ann Mills Griffith had a lot to do with that when she came to see me one day uh, <clears throat> and raised hell with me in my office as Secretary of Defense. And um, others uh, here, too. Um, Ambassador Moose knows a lot about this because I think one of the jobs he had as a young early diplomat was uh, in Vietnam. Um, your question is a relevant question. And I'm, I'm not as up to date on things today as I once was, but uh, I would just say that where we can help the Vietnamese, and I get your point, there's a, no longer a North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, it's Vietnamese. What's past is past, it's over, it's over. Uh, and so we have to go forward on that basis. And so we do need to make some adjustments, I think, uh, in that program. And, and I, get, uh, I get your point. Is, uh, is your mother, is she okay? Wherever you are. Or, uh, she passed away two years after my, my dad. So I was in the open, but it was about six years. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, you've done pretty well. Thank you, sir. 
<laughs> You're pretty smart. Um, again, thank you. It's been a privilege to be with you. Bye-bye. <laughs>